All right, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another video. Here we got another passage breakdown for you guys. Okay, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Eric, and I'm on a mission to make sure that this MCAS is as easy as possible for you guys. Okay, because I know what it's like to be a pre med. You have a lot going on here. The MCAT should not be this crazy, impossible exam that you know a lot of people make it out to be. It's it's actually really easy when you know what to do. Okay, so don't tell yourself it's hard. It's actually easy. Okay, so before I break this down, go ahead and do the passage and questions on your own first. Okay, I'm gonna show you guys exactly how to pick the best answer, how to highlight, how to read figures, how to make these details make sense, all that stuff, okay? So before I do that, do the passage on your own first. So pause it whenever you need to, read it. Okay, read the whole thing. Pick your answer for question one. Pick your answer for two, three, four, Pause it whenever you need to. Five. Okay, cool. Let's begin. Resume the video. I'm going to break it down for you right now. Okay. Transcranial magnetic stimulation of the motor cortex uses a powerful focused magnetic field to depolarize brain neurons and elicit motor evoked potentials from the skeletal muscle. Okay, I'm highlighting. I'm highlighting to make a note in my head of what the heck TMS does. All right, TMS. It uses a magnetic field and that depolarizes brain neurons. Okay. And it makes the motor evoked potential from the skeletal muscle. Cool. It's that simple. An MEP may be defined as a recording of the electrical muscular response elicited by artificially stimulating the motor cortex, which can cause muscle movement as well. All right. So an MEP is literally just the recording, the information given to us from the TMS. That's it. Okay, so that, that's it. MEPs are useful as a method for assessing the integrity of the central to peripheral nervous system path. All right, I don't, I don't really need to highlight that. That's kind of obvious here. MEP amplitude is taken as an indicator of cortical motor excitability. I'll highlight that too. Makes sense. You know, MEP is that information of the recording. And TMS stimulates muscle cells to contract. That's it. Okay. Pathological conditions that affect the efferent and afferent paths are varied. For example, spinal cord injuries may result in a severing of a section of the spinal cord that relays impulses to the muscle. Okay. In Parkinson's disease, dopaminer dopaminergic cells in the brain die and motor movements become slow shaking and increasingly difficult. All right. I kind of knew this from my content review that it's the dopaminergic cells from Parkinson's disease. You know, when these die, it causes Parkinson's disease, but I'm going to highlight because what they say in the passage is always correct. It doesn't matter my content review. If I thought, Hey, maybe it was uh, dopamine and serotonin. No, whatever they say in the passage is correct. So Parkinson's disease is caused by dopaminergic cells dying. That's it. Okay. That's it. And because of that, the movements become slow, shaking, increasingly difficult. TMS can be used to differentiate if the communication problem is in the brain or in the periphery. And they give us a figure here. We do not look at the figure. We only look at the figure when the question asks for it. We could read the caption though. That's fine. The effect of six different motor protocols on MEP amplitude. All right, this is the recording. This is the MEP. DYN, dynamic, the subject was moving during the task. STA static, the subject's hand remained at rest during the task. Okay. A TMS experiment was conducted to test the excitatory effects of motor imagery and action observation in the first dorsal interosseous, interosseous, the muscle responsible for flexing, closing the index finger when making a fist. Okay, so they're testing the muscle, this muscle here. Okay, and this muscle is involved in making a fist. Okay, when they use AO or MI, what happens? Do we get more active activity in that muscle? Do we get less activity in that muscle? What happens? Do we get more depolarization, less depolarization? What happens? All right. Five healthy subjects were asked to perform three pairs of motor protocols, each comprised of 20 trials over five minutes. In the first protocol, the subject observed a video, AO, of a stranger opening and closing a fist. Next, the subject was asked to imagine opening and closing his slash her own fist. MI. So MI is the 
imagining and AO is watching the uh, action. Finally, the subject both observed and imagined movements of the hand AO plus MI. Each protocol is performed once with the subject's own hand at rest and separately with the subject actively opening and closing his hand. During each protocol, in 10 of the 20 trials, MEPs were elicited from the FDI. Okay, so in 10 out of 20, they got their MEPs, the results, and the group results are shown in figure one. Cool. All right, and that's the results. Easy passage, not too hard, guys. All right, this depolarization, the neuromuscular junction, you guys should be very, very, very confident in those. Okay, those are actually really, really high yields. So it's a really good passage. Okay, they're always going to test this, always. Question one. Which sequence properly indicates the transmission path of impulses as a direct result of transcranial magnetic stimulation? Okay, well, they told us that TMS was involved in depolarizing neurons that do what? What do these neurons do? They elicit motor evoked potentials from the skeletal muscle. So they want us to name the pathway of going from your brain to your skeletal muscles. That's it. Okay. Sensory neurons? No, we don't begin with sensory neurons. Okay. Skeletal muscle cells? No, we don't begin with that. We begin with the cerebral cortex, specifically the primary motor cortex. Okay. And that's going to go ahead, send information to our spinal cord. Yeah. Efferent neurons. Okay. These are our motor neurons. And they're going to go to our skeletal muscle cells. That's going to tell our muscle cells to contract. Cool. Easy, simple. Answer C. All right, I don't even have to look at this one. I already know the answer C. It's perfect. And that's it. Like, that's an like easy... <laughs> that's how it is. That's literally how the MCAT is, okay? I mean, yes, there could be a little harder questions, okay? But when you break it down and you tell yourself it's easy and it makes sense, answers are pretty obvious. L-DOPA is a common medication administrated to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. What is the likely mechanism of L-DOPA? Well, they told us Parkinson's disease is from the dopaminergic cells dying. All right, so if we want to treat that, we want to increase dopamine concentrations, okay? They die. We're lacking dopamine here. So how do we do this? How do we fix this? We increase dopamine concentration. Simple. L-dopa increases dopamine concentration. Yeah. <laughs> Decreases? No. Breaks down the blood-brain barrier. It, there's no... And there's no evidence in the past of suggesting the blood-brain barrier. They don't even talk about it once. So this is a huge reach. Okay, maybe it does this. I don't know. I never studied L-DOPA. Maybe it does this, maybe it doesn't. But that's a reach because it was never mentioned in the passage. So C is wrong. L-DOPA converts glucose to dopamine. Okay, same thing with C. All right, I do not know. The, I have not studied L-DOPA. I don't know if it does do this, convert glucose to dopamine. Maybe, maybe not. But it was never mentioned once in this passage. They never gave us the slightest hint on it converting glucose to dopamine. So these two are wrong. The answer is A. And this is a good representation of other questions on the MCAT. Okay, a lot of students, they look at these reach, you know, these reach answers, and they'll think, hmm, maybe, maybe it's right. No, don't convince yourself. Stick to the evidence, stick to what you know. Answer to two is A. Which of the following processes is involved in the motor evoked potential elicited by transcranial magnetic stimulation. Again, these motor evoked potentials on skeletal muscle, okay, you should know, you should have information on the neuromuscular junction. You should know what happens there, okay? In the neuromuscular junction, all right, the motor neuron releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will go and bind to a receptor on the skeletal muscle, all right? And this receptor is going to uh, open up when acetylcholine binds. Sodium is gonna run in there, it's gonna influx in the skeletal muscle, and that's gonna have a action potential propagate down the muscle cell. And when it does that, that's gonna eventually tell the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, all right? And that calcium is gonna go and guess what, guys? It's going to go bind to uh, troponin, and that's going to move the tropomyosin, I believe, off of the actin, and then from there you can get myosin and actin binding, okay? So what I just said, we involved the sodium influx, okay? We need that. That influx is going into the motor, um, the muscle cell. 
calcium release, we need that to bind to troponin. CL minus efflux, we do not need that. That was never mentioned in the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so answer is one and two. Answer is D. See? See how easy that was? Where, where's the MCAT hard? Where? Would the leg muscles of a patient paralyzed due to spinal cord transaction be expected to exhibit MEPs? Okay, if we have a spinal cord transaction here and this patient is paralyzed, okay, remember MEPs is the recording, okay, we're not going to have MEPs. All right, think about it. You're literally cutting the spinal cord. Think of like a horizontal slice, okay? Bam, right through the spinal cord. Do you think his legs are going to move? No, they're not going to move, all right? No, because the motor cortex is damaged, okay? The spinal cord is damaged, not the brain. The motor cortex is in the brain, all right? So this is wrong. No, because the muscle response requires an intact pathway. That is correct, okay? We need the information to go from the motor cortex in the brain, all right, down to the spinal cord, and from the spinal cord to the motor neuron, okay? And if we can't go from spinal cord to motor neuron, we're disrupting the whole pathway, and if we're disrupting the whole pathway, we're not gonna have that, you know, leg muscle move or exhibit any type of MEP, okay? So the answer to this one's B. Yes, no, these two are wrong. Okay, we literally paralyze this patient, okay? Do you really expect to have a recording? No. The student in charge of the experiment wishes to present his slash her findings in support of the theory that motor imagery and action observation together facilitate a greater increase in motor excitability than either protocol alone. Which of the following would be the best reason to withhold this presentation? Okay, so we're trying to tell the student, hey, don't present your findings. There could be something wrong. Okay, there could be a confounding variable there. All right, do not present it. It could be something wrong. They're, they're asking us, okay, they're, when you guys get these types of questions, okay, you have to think, what are they trying to test us on? Are they trying to test us on... Uh, are they trying to test us on the nervous system? Are they trying to test us on information in the passage? Are they trying to test us on, you know, classic experimental procedure information, okay? Information regarding how experiments are conducted, all right? In this question, they're trying to test your information on how experiments are conducted, all right? This is how I'm, I'm getting into the test maker's head here, all right? I see that they're trying to perform an experiment and show your findings, but in an experiment, okay, you need certain things to go on. You need your control. You need your results. You need your negative, your positive control, okay? You need those. So let's see which one goes along with that, all right? Because remember, we're withholding these findings. So A, the procedure used did not include MEP recordings prior to each task. Okay, I like this question. I mean, I, my bad. I like this answer, but I'm going to keep going to B, C, and D. I like this because you need MEP recordings before and after to say, hey, this is what happened before, and then after we did the AO and MI, this is what happened after. These are my results before, these are my results after. Look, guys, look at my findings, okay? And this would help support this theory, all right? So I like A, but let's keep going. MEP amplitude in an individual are typically highly consistent. This is wrong here, okay? This is wrong because this is the MEP result here, and I do not think these are rather consistent. Okay, look, if we have static, you know, we have different, this is high, this is low. I don't think these are consistent at all. Okay. So I don't like B. Let's keep going. The motor task performed in the experiment were too simple. No, this is a lazy answer. Okay, this is a lazy answer. That's how I view it. Also, you're giving a muscle cell a motor task. Okay, you're telling somebody to move and you're looking at the muscle depolarization, the MEP. Okay, a muscle's main job is to move. All right, it's not, it's not too simple. That's fine. Okay, so C is wrong. The six different conditions were run in random order. Again, this is a lazy answer. 
six different conditions were run in random order. But I guess you could tell her, hey, they were ran in random order. Don't present these findings. I mean, some in some experiments and some research, they are ran in random order. And that does kind of help people's results and findings. Okay, to show that nothing was skewed, you know, there was no bias towards any experiment. So this could happen in some experiments. This is an okay answer, but I like this answer because this tells me exactly like, hey, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to represent my findings here. This is before and this is after. So I like A here. Okay, this is a good question. Very good question here. Okay, do I feel amazing about this? No, I don't feel amazing. Do I feel good? Yeah, I feel good. And that's enough. Okay, that's enough because these are just not it. So the answer for this one is A. And let's check to see if we got all of them right. Okay, I do these live for you guys. One is C. Okay. Two is A. Perfect. Three is D. Awesome. Four is B. Awesome. Five is A. Okay, and here's the explanations if you guys want to look at them. All right. Cool. That's it. All right. As always, guys, if you want to work one-on-one -on -one with me, go ahead to the comment section below. Click on the link. Okay, you're going to see a link. Fill out the form, schedule an interview, and then we'll see if we're a good fit to work with each other. Comment down below what you guys think. Comment down below if you got all of them right or all of them wrong. See where you guys went wrong. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.